Good evening. Welcome to what is built to be a very interesting discussion, and I'll tell you why. It's because we're here at the United Nations Complex in Gigiri, Nairobi, and we are with the mayor's managers of urban areas from all over the world. They're gathered here for the UN Habitat uh, Governing Council meeting that is going on in Nairobi. And we thought, let's bring people together in the room and start learning from each other. What can urban areas in the world learn from each other? Cities are changing. People are changing in terms of their relationship to each other and to the cities in which they live. The language now is no longer that of rural urban migration. It is that of making people enjoy the lives that they live in cities and ensure that they actually get economic benefits from them. So we thought, let's bring people together who actually do manage cities and hear and learn from them. And we hope that this discussion will actually be a very enlightening one. And I'll tell you why, because I want to begin with Dr. John Kloss, your head of UN Habitat here in Nairobi, but you've managed um, a world famous city and you've managed it extremely well. Thank you. What sort of lessons do you think these two experiences um, are able to give you? Well, I think that the issue of urbanization and the rapid growth of it, it's, it's now uh, uh, you know, in front of us because uh, the figures are uh, astonishing. More than 50% of the world population is already living in cities. And uh, it's been said that the predictions say that in 20 to 30 years, uh, another 25% of the world population will be living in cities. And this will change you know, the, the international scenario in the sense that urbanization is requiring a lot of investment, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, changes in governance uh, systems, uh, enforcement of local authorities, and these kind of things. Uh, then we are beginning a kind of uh, urban area in human history that uh, is very relevant. Esther uses an interesting story. We were laughing just now about the fact that you said you're from a village that's very close to Nairobi, but yet you only saw the city of Nairobi for the first time when you came to university. So I think you're the perfect person to ask. The relationship between a rural area and an urban area, do you feel that that relationship is as it should be? Um, thank you very much. And yes, I'm Esther Moramuru. I'm from Kenya. And I grew uh, up in Limuru in a village called Rironi. And until when I got a scholarship to come to the University of Nairobi, that's the only time I came to Nairobi. And I think what is happening is that uh, traditionally the cities are not places that are welcoming to young people. And I think uh, what we feel, particularly as people who are in the pre-urban areas, it feels that things have to change. And I think we have seen tremendous change since the I would say for me since 1996, uh, especially with the coming of the Habitat II conference, when there was this uh, creation of a partnership uh, among all the actors in the cities, and cities have been thinking differently. We have not seen enough of creating space for young people, particularly coming from poor backgrounds, because besides myself coming from a poor background, and coming to sit the city at a very young age, I also work with young people. I do gender work, but I also work with young women and young men from Madara slums and Korogocha slums. And I know that they are suffering. They are in the city, but we'll, they we'll do come, not. We'll come to that question because it's actually a very important one, how young people relate to the cities in which they live. And Mayor Masunda, it's a bit unfair to ask you about young people and your white hair on your head. <laughs> but I think it's a crucial question because what Esther raises about people, young people coming to the cities, in most of our African cities, Asian cities, Latin American cities, when that move happens, they typically come and settle into informal settlements, what we might call slums, before they find their way into the urban life and the economic life of that city. How do you manage that as the mayor of Harare, for instance? I think one thing that struck me within a very short space of time after getting into the hot seat as from the 1st of July 2008 was the need to have an inclusive city, a livable city, a city that uh, is going to cater for a divergence of, uh, of interests, you know, from, ranging from the young, you know, the women, the vulnerable, the widowed, the wealthy, and, uh, and so forth. I mean, and, and that uh, reflects itself in the 28 housing estates that uh, 
fall under the jurisdiction of the city of Harare. They range from the most densely populated, which is Mbari, to, to the most plush, uh, which is Borodil Brook. So to have a range in the 28 housing estates that uh, we manage of uh, the, the poor to, the, to those that have got money coming out of their ears. So, so as a city, it's important for us to strike a balance you know, in terms of meeting the needs and expectations of all those people that uh, gravitate towards the city in search of not only the bright lights, but uh, in search of their fortunes. All right, Anna, yours is perhaps um, a bit of a different challenge. What's happening now is a lot of cities are starting to become attractive to people from all over the world. So your skilled people think, I do not want to live in Oslo anymore. I want to live in Shanghai. I want to live in New York. I want to live perhaps even in Nairobi. Mm. Now, how do you attract your citizens to stay on in the cities in which uh, you manage? And how do you ensure that the people who are looking for opportunity, as the mayor says, the bright lights and the big cities, are actually attracted to your cities and can be able to establish themselves economically? Mm. Well, you know, we are facing um, uh, some severe challenges. Um, you were mentioning urbanization. The, another severe challenge that we face all over the world is the, quick, the, the growing young population. Within a few years, uh, more than 60% of, of uh, the global population will be under 18 years of age. Now, I think that um, the key to um, the key to uh, uh, in order to avoid that this generation is a lost generation to make sure that, uh, that the cities provide economic opportunities and that we create livable cities where they want to create their, their identity to, to, to uh, raise their families, we need to include them. I was just yesterday told about a fascinating uh, example here from Kenya, uh, CC Niamani, which is an SMS-based platform that was created by young people just before the elections here in Kenya, uh, where uh, the young voices were able to uh, communicate their desires for community development uh, and to spread it, to spread the world, the word. Now, uh, I think that as city managers, as mayors, as politicians, it is our duty to make sure that these voices, the young voices, are heard and included. We need to construct cities that take into account what the young generation needs and wants for the future. And that needs to be done now. So we need to create arenas where these voices can be actually heard. Isn't it easier, Mr. Manager, I'm sorry, Mr. Manager, Mr. Mayor, you are a city manager, but isn't it easier to manage a city for old people? Old people don't have too many demands. Young people <laughs> will demand schools for their children. They will demand discos to go on Saturday nights. They'll demand churches. They'll demand roads that can accommodate their fast cars. Old people just want to sit there and live a good life. But young people have too many demands. I think the older people have their own special needs. And, and especially in a country like ours, where most of the support structures were devastated during the politically induced uh, socio-economic meltdown. So unlike in the past, where the older people would have a fallback position in terms of the pensions that, uh, and nest eggs that are, the, that are built up over the years. You know, I find myself in a, an invidious position as mayor in doing more than just uh, what is expected normally of a mayor. We have the Harare Mayor's Chair Fund which has been in existence for the last 60 years. And the Mayor's Chair Fund was established specifically to cater for the needs of uh, the vulnerable members of the community only at Christmas time. That was why it was called yes. Christmas Chair Fund. But uh, in the last 58 months that I've been in office, I find that uh, we are now catering for the needs of a total of 86 charitable organizations, which include the elderly. And, uh, and that fund is headed by my wife and 12 volunteers. And we have a tall order in terms of mobilizing financial and uh, material resources to support you know, not only the elderly, but uh, the orphanages and, uh, and other members of the community who are not capable of taking care of themselves. There's something you say that strikes me, and, and perhaps you, Esther, would want to answer it, where the mayor speaks about engaging with charities, engaging with non-governmental actors, and you are part of those non-governmental actors. 
there is some level of complaint that you're not elected, so therefore how would you speak on behalf of young people? But young people need to have a voice, and they don't necessarily have the strongest voices when it comes to city management. I think, I think increasingly young people, and particularly the role that uh, the civil society has played, at least in my country, I know, they have understood very well you don't have to be in a position of power to be able to influence the decisions that are made there. In an organization like Groots Kenya, all we do on a day-to-day -day basis is sharpening and enhancing the capacity of the people in this city to be able to make demands and make sure that the city of Nairobi, to be able to make sure that the national government is responsive to the needs of the people. But you know, it is good to us to, to, to really demand. It is also important for young people to know they have a responsibility. You know, it's, it's so easy for you to say that, but, but in practical terms, when you speak about Nairobi, for instance, and young people say we want a voice, the voice they are demanding is a voice that they can go up to the mayor and say, this is what I want. But what the mayor is concerned with is that the city looks good. So if a young man is out selling samosas on the streets, he's going to get chased by the mayor's people. Now, how do you get that voice in? Well, I think if you engage communities and the uh, residents of the city to be part of the planning, they will be able to do the business and do the business in the right place. I think it calls uh, uh, the mayors, the managers of the city to open the space for dialogue and for participatory planning. Because what the people are saying, we do not want to sell madazis, we do not want to sell our warehouses where things are not defined. What we want to have is a planned city which has appreciated that we must make life out of this city. That we are here to stay, we are not going to, Dr. Karas has just said that we are urbanizing. And I think in this country, we have seen the mega growth of this city. It is beyond what we could have expected 10 years uh, uh, ago. But we must make sure that this city is possible for people to live across social and gender and political class. And, and I think advocacy is one of the things that will sharpen people's... Dr. Uh, Klaus, you heard me saying samosas and his Yeah, <laughs> No, no, I think that in a more structural yes. uh, way, we need to, inf uh, to uh, uh, inf enforce uh, and we need to strengthen local governments. You know, there's something that perhaps the Scandinavians, they have a very good history, because even in Scandinavia, their countries way, they, the country was formed from the local authorities. Mm -hmm. And one way to guarantee and facilitate the participation of the people is that the government approaches the people. Yes. Yes. And one way that the government approaches the people is just empowering the local governments. And in that sense, the move of the Kenyan constitution to, to establish the county administration, and now I, uh, we are looking very, very, you know, in a, in a very hopeful manner how the, it this evolved. Because now these counties, uh, they are going to be empowered. They are going to have a role in the political scenario of Kenya. And that for the urbanization and for, uh, you know, uh, approaching the politics and the policies to the people, uh, it's going to be a big opportunity. And even the youth and, and gender, uh, women should, you know, um, uh, uh, enter in this uh, level of power in a very, uh, in a very convinced uh, way. I think that the, the experience of the Scandinavian countries in that sense is extraordinary. In, even in the Scandinavian some countries, the, the local government is the one who collects the taxes. They keep the taxes for themselves that they need, and they, a little bit of them, it goes to the central government. When usually it's the other way around, I'm isn't glad, it? Yes, I'm glad you raised that because I don't know, everyone is saying Scandinavia is a ways to go, but how easy is it to establish that method of working? How easy is it to make the cities the locus of national life? Well, I think, uh, let me start by saying that we mustn't sit up here and, and sound as if um, uh, uh, the voice of the youth or other marginal group is, 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 uh, is uh, a challenge. It's a resource. You know, we need the young, we need this voice. We need the resources of the, the, the young people to create, to create this new brave world. Um, and uh, and uh, that is why it's our duty and it's so important to, 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 to create these arenas. Um, I think maybe we need a, a, a slight change of mindsets. 
Uh, I don't think it's easy. And I but think it's a, a little bit of a culture as well. The reason why that happens is because the more voices you have making demands, as Esther is saying, and you have a mayor sitting there, he's thinking these are more constituencies to please. And that's a very difficult thing. <laughs> but now we're saying they're making demands. But they are raising their voice to, to um, appeal, to, to find ways of using their resources, you know, to, to, to make a better world for their children again. And, and, and um, you know, we don't have a lot of time uh, to, uh, with, with the rapid urbanization we see now. Planning takes time. Mr. Kloss, I'm sure, can, can talk a lot about that. Uh, I, I've never been a mayor, but planning is a, planning is a time consuming matter. You know, we have to start now to produce or to, to create cities where, with, uh, uh, that are livable and that um, um, create equ equity. Um, that are sustainable environmentally and socially. So um, we need these voices and these ideas raised from the young generation because they know what they need for the future. And, and those plans need to be developed now. So we need each other. It's not a demand, it's, 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 it's a reasonable, uh, uh, it's, it, it's a very reasonable request. I will ask two questions, that, and, and you're free to jump in with uh, your contribution, Mr. Mayor, but I want you to throw this in as you respond. The cities in which we live in, especially in Africa of all places, and Zimbabwe and Kenya specifically, mm -hmm. were designed with apartheid in mind, mm -hmm. which is why you find Harare, for instance, or Nairobi, the core, the center of the city, what we call the CBD, the Central Business District, is very organized. The streets are clean, they are wide, they are lit up. But you go into the periphery, what used to be the African areas, mm -hmm. they are what the disorganization comes from. Now, you're managing a city that's a living organism. How do you make sure that that is no longer the legacy you carry forward with you? Well, in Harare, we have the good fortune of having had a very solid base from a planning uh, perspective. So, so we've uh, picked up that ball from there and we're running with it. We have a fully-fledged urban planning services department and a fully-fledged housing and community services department, amongst other eight or ten major departments that are seized with particular responsibilities. But, uh, but I like the point that uh, Anna raises of, uh, of making sure that we have sustainable cities. That is the key thing. And all that is predicated upon planning. Because without planning, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. And uh, I think the most important thing that needs to happen, especially in uh, cities in developing uh, countries, is to depoliticize service delivery issues. And, and that's why I'm so fascinated about the model that uh, is being put in place in Nairobi to have uh, a governor who is uh, going to be responsible for, for not only Nairobi, but greater Nairobi, if you like, you know, which is, I believe is now going to be a metropolitan uh, county. But more than that, what needs to happen more of, especially in cities is uh, the need for the city to be self-sustaining. I mean, in Harare, for instance, we don't get any funding from central government. And that's been the case even before independence. So it's not a post-independence uh, phenomenon. You know, we, we have a 600 million US dollar revenue and capital expenditure budget, and we have to fund it you know, from our own operations. Because in most cases, especially in the case of uh, capital cities, you know, the capital cities should be treated as a business enterprise because Harare is responsible for over 40% of the country's GDP. The, I'm the, sure that's, yeah. that's the case as well in Nairobi. There's something again, um, and it's all sort of feeding into each other. And I want to bring in Dr. Kloss because not only are you, are you now the head of UN Habitat, but you're involved in more or less the rebirth of Barcelona in Spain. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, if you sit there and speak to the mayor of Harare, what he will say, the lesson that he takes from it, is that you should have an Olympics. Thank you should you. build for a World Cup. You should bid yes. for an Africa Cup of Nations, oh. which then means there's a lot of attention paid to your city. There's going to be a lot of money coming in, and that will be your mm. impetus to change that city. Is that always a lesson to learn? Well, it depends. In, in each case, it's different. You know? In the case of Barcelona, for example, uh, we thought in the Olympic Games because we had a huge crisis. We had uh, something that for us it was very, uh, you know, unexpected. Uh, after the first crisis of the oil prices in 73, our industry, at, in a very short period of time, 
it became obsolete, it became too expensive. And we lost a lot of uh, jobs from the industry. And then we had a lot of uh, unemployed people. And then we were looking, well, what are we going to do? You know, we have the city here, we have the people here, it, and there's no jobs. And uh, of course, we needed investment. And, and then uh, it occurred to us to say, okay, let's organize here a big thing. <laughs> and in fact, Olympic Games uh, you know, was one of the alternatives because we were thinking, oh, well, let's think in a world fair, Olympic Games, you know, Barcelona was a very industrial city. It, it, it was not very keen in exports, uh, sorry, in sports. It was, the sport was, you know. Barcelona, the, yeah, with the football but, team. Yeah, <laughs> but then uh, suddenly when, when, when we beat and we won the beat for the Olympic Games, everybody understood that this was a mechanism of changing the city. Yeah? The important thing for us, not what, it was not just the feast of the Olympic Games. The, the important thing is to manage all the process in order to do in the city all the things needed to change the nature of the city. And we move from an industrial city to a post-industrial city. But Dr. With Kloster, culture, question, yes. uh, tourism, But and the all question that. is this, and, and that's what I was getting to, is your example is a good one. And there are some cities that have managed to do that process. I think the last time it happened was in South Africa with the um, Football World yes, Cup three yes. years ago. The problem is that if a governor of a county in Kenya is watching this program, they'll say, that's what I need to do. I need to do a big project to transform my county, to transform my urban areas. Yeah. And that might end up having disinvestment or investment in the wrong things. Yes, well, um, but uh, I think that uh, you need to think that investment is coming if there's some kind of uh, guarantees that the investment will produce its return. Huh? Because nobody gives money for nothing. Uh, everybody gives money expecting a return of this money. And then you need to build up a, a platform which is not just physical, it's also juridical, it's, it's uh, legislative, yes. in order to uh, guarantee that uh, the investment is going to have its return. And this is very important. In order to be on the, at the level of investment, you need to guarantee a minimum set of conditions, and urban planning is one, the first probably. You know, you, you need to, to begin with urban planning, as the mayor uh, has said, because without urban planning, you don't have enough public space. The, we have done satellite photos of all the cities, of, of most of the cities of the world, and we are measuring how much of each city it's allocating to the streets and communication um, yes. patterns. In a planet city, usually this is 30% of the land. In an unplanned city, usually it's eight, nine, ten percent. This is a huge difference. There's a huge need of urban planning because if you don't have urban planning and you don't have a street, you cannot move in the city and the productivity of the city is not of interest to the investment, to the private investment. Here then brings you in, Esther, with your inclusion of young people, with your, you said I can't use the word demands, but this inclusion sometimes means for city managers, mayors and the likes, they say these young people don't pay that much in taxes. They don't pay that much because they don't own land, they won't pay land rates, they don't earn that much, they won't pay much in income tax. And so the question of resources that Dr. Kloss is talking about, you're asking to be included, but you're not paying for that inclusion. Well, uh, I, th I think we must make a deeper analysis of what contribution means. Contribution is not just about money. I want to give you, you asked, what do we do with these cities that are already cluttered? Yes, yes. Nairobi being one of them. Madare, Kibera. I have worked in Madare for the last 15 years. And I do know that for many years, the city of Nairobi was unable to get garbage out of Madare. Who was able to organize communities to get garbage out of Madare? And later, in all the other estates, is the young people. So they did have a plan. They may not have come with the money, but they did have the knowledge. I want to tell you, when I started doing this work in human settlement, and I was working in Madari, all the city council uh, toilets were, were, had gone to disuse, and they were being used in the spaces where women used to be raped. The women, uh, through what we do, local to local dialogue, engaged the city mayor engaged with the, the, the political leaders, and they said, 
We only want you to give us the opportunity to demonstrate how to make our city safer. And they cleaned those toilets with the well-wishers from diplomatic communities. Women of the diplomats, whites of the diplomats, would come and give Groots Kenya a couple of dollars. And with that, the women were able to rehabilitate most of the toilets in Madari. And it became a case study. Now today, we of course see uh, new uh, young people, like the young man who is helping to construct toilets there. And I think this is what we need to account for, that the, the young people, they do have a mindset. They want to contribute. But I think the way we are counting their contribution is so traditional. It's not just about money. They have knowledge. They have expertise. And this is what they want. They want to bring on board. Young women, women, they have lived experiences. We want to give them an opportunity to share their experiences and tell us, how is it to live in these cities? So that it can inform the managers. And I think this is the role the civil society, I think, has played very, very well. Ensuring that there is a space to share our stories, ensuring that we can unleash our potential that may be not quantified in the traditional way. But here is my worry. And, and may I Masunda, my worry is about you now. Mm -hmm. Because what happens with Esther's initiatives and the people that she interacts with, the young people who go and say the city council of Nairobi, the city council of Harare, has led this toilet to be in disuse, has not collected garbage here in two or three years. We shall do it ourselves. That then absolves you of your responsibility. And what happens is that you're absolved of responsibility, that's number one. Number two, mm -hmm. you pay more attention to the big businesses, back to the tax issue, that pay the money that you can meet on the golf course because the young person, you'll only meet him outside your window as you're driving past. Yeah, in fact, uh it doesn't absolve me from the responsibility at all. If anything, it, uh, it enhances my uh, involvement because uh, we have through the Junior Council a uh, concept. You know, in fact, the Junior Council is celebrating its 60th anniversary. So it, it encompasses uh, uh, lower sixth uh, form students drawn from 66 schools. So that's a mirror image of the Senior Council. So we get these uh, young uh, Turks to be imbued with that sense of, uh, of civic duty, you know, and they become aware of the need for them to play their part along the lines that uh, Esther mentioned. So when they grow up, uh, they, they, they realize that uh, there's a civic responsibility when it comes to running cities, one. And two, they also get an opportunity to undergo some uh, uh, career guidance counseling because of the various departments, the engineering services, town clerk department, city treasurer, and so forth. And we have a, a, a system there uh, which is funded by some uh, corporates, you know, a vocational scholarship scheme. So we get these bright sparks you know, from high schools. They come and, and be sponsored by the city, which then sees them through universities. And they come back and serve the city for the equivalent number of years during which they would have been sponsored at university. Right. And uh, so it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's one way of, uh, of actually attracting uh, talented young people to come and work in the city. Dr. Los, you want to jump Yeah, no, it's just uh, in relation to, to what has been said, it's quite clear that the society and the grassroots and, and the people is ready to cooperate and work because people want the improvement. And, and if you ask them and you offer them an alternative, they will come. Here, though, we need to find out a strategy to break this uh, thing that you had mentioned, that uh, in many parts of Africa, you have the business district which is planned, and then uh, suddenly the plan disappears. Yes. Uh? Yes. And, and we have a, a, a specific proposal for that. And we say that the first strategy should be to plan a city extension. You know, to take a piece of land as near possible, and if, pos if possible, connected to the business district, and do a big exercise of planet city extension. Uh, this is a specific uh, uh, program that we propose. And in fact, we have already 35 cities in the world that they are coming to us, and we are working to together. Because it's what you are saying. You know, if the business district, which is planned, the plan is very small, let's enlarge this planning and make it accessible to other people. Now, the, prob the problem is that, of course, some mayors and some uh, uh, governors around Africa, they come to me and they tell, yesterday, 
even in public. One of them told us, you know, I have such a big and such a number of issues that I don't know where, to, to, start. where, where to start. Mm -hmm. And I always answer, please, if you don't know where to start, let's start by a planet city extension connected with the core of the city in order that the water company, the electric uh, utility, enlarges its services to the new plan area, and then we begin to feel the economies of urbanization. Because the economies of urbanization come up after the well-designed compactness, which distributes the cost of the services to many people. And then the, 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 the bills, are lower because if you do flat urbanization in miles and miles and miles there's no way to provide uh, services mm. because the cost uh, it's it jumps to the stars huh? just one second mr mayor i want to bring in uh, Anne into this discussion and, and the way to solve all these problems if you ask me is what used to be done 30 years ago let's keep everyone in the rural areas <laughs> discourage them from coming into cities i remember there was that whole discussion in the 1980s about rural urban migration. And the mm. key issue there was, don't have rural urban migration. Mm. Let people stay on the farms, let people stay in the villages, <laughs> let the cities be for the cities. And when you reach the age of the white hair, <laughs> go back to the village. <laughs> Simple solution. Right, I, I, I don't think the strategy would be to stop the urbanization. But I do think there's one aspect that we haven't discussed here and that not everyone needs necessarily to move to the biggest city. Mm. We also need strategies for the smaller and the middle-sized cities. And we must remember that, you know, even in the future, we will need someone to grow our food. We will need someone to take up the natural resources. You know, we will need, we need each other. Yes. And, and, uh, and uh, let's not forget that strategies for uh, middle-sized cities is also very, very important to ensure regional balance nationally uh, and globally. You know, we, 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 we do need a regional balance. Uh, we do need to uh, develop uh, regionalization strategies between the surrounding areas outside the cities as well because the different, uh, the different areas need each other. Um, and uh, and uh, for the, the, the national economies, not least, um, uh, this is important to ensure that we use both natural resources and human resources as, as, uh, as, good, as, as good as possible. Because May I must you wanted to jump in, but, but as you answer the question again, I'm throwing another one right at okay. you. Um, and it's that question of when you have a city that's so big that it almost swallows the country. You speak about Harare being 40% of Zimbabwe's GDP. If you put maybe Harare and Bulawayo, that's the whole of Zimbabwe. If you look at Kenya, Nairobi is, I think, in excess of 60%. Mm -hmm. If you take Nairobi, Mombasa, Kisumu, and Eldoret, that's the whole country done, and probably one other urban area. And that's dangerous because Nairobi, for example, sits very near the Rift Valley. If there's an earthquake, that's it. If anything happened to Harare, Zimbabwe no longer exists. Yeah, I think uh, that's why it's very important to have in the plan, the overall plan, a devolution uh, process. What Anne is talking about. Along the lines uh -huh. that she's talking about. I'm going to give you an example. In uh, Zimbabwe, we grow a lot of sugar in the law felt, which is about 500 kilometers from uh, Harare. And there's been a deliberate policy on the part of the, of the companies and individuals who are involved in the growing of sugar to make sure that uh, there are sustainable towns that are developed in the immediate vicinity of where the sugar is grown. We're now seeing a migration of skilled individuals from Harare going to manage those sugar estates. But isn't that your tax base, your skills base, leaving you? You're not going to be very happy about that, will you? No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's all right. In a way, it is. But the bulk of the people that actually do the growing of sugar are outside Rari. So they will still retain maybe a head office in Rari. So we still benefit you know, from the property tax, which is our principal source of revenue. But I also wanted to touch on uh, a point that uh, Dr. John Kloss raised earlier about the importance of planning, especially when you have the good opportunity or good fortune of hosting a, a major uh, sporting event. In 1995, we hosted the All Africa Games, and one of uh, the satellite urban settlements to to Arari, which is about 30 kilometers away, and it's got a population 
of over 1.5 million, Chitungwiza, was given an opportunity of uh, having a, a state-of-the-art aquatic complex, Olympic size, the works. That was the wrong place for that aquatic complex to be, but it was driven more by emotion on the part of the minister that was responsible for sport at the time because that happened to be his constituency. Chitung was his constituency. Yes, and immediately after the games, the, the aquatic complex became the proverbial white elephant. And today, that facility is being used for all sorts of things that are not remotely connected with any aquatic discipline. So that's a wasted investment, which, again, is a graphic illustration of the point that uh, Dr. Kloss was at pains to make about the way you know, the facilities and infrastructure were developed in Barcelona to be in sync with uh, the future of the city. Because how easy is it, Dr. Kloss, and I'm sorry to bring you back to the Olympics and all that, because that complaint has been had in so many different occasions. In the Olympics, I think it was Montreal that had that similar problem. Yeah. They still, I think, only managed to finish paying their debt a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, also, other cities, people have said, if you do this big event, if you host even the UN Habitat Governing Council as Nairobi, that's if you have gone broke. Yes. And uh, Evans yes. will no longer have money. How do you deal with that problem? We, we, we as I said, uh, we had a very big crisis then. And, and we were very tough with the Olympic Committee. And we said to the Olympic com uh, Committee, listen, we want the chairman of the local Olympic Committee be the mayor. <laughs> and we have been, I think, the only Olympic Committee that I remember that it has been shared by the mayor. Yes. And then all the team of the mayor, I was then deputy mayor, uh, uh, all the team of the mayor, we were in the core of the design. Then we were designing the thing, of course, to serve the Olympics, but the, the underlying strategy, it was not the Olympics, it was the future of the city. Mm -hmm. Which, this conversation and, and something of uh, what Anne was saying about developing the smaller areas, would it then have made sense to establish a university in the road? So you'd never have had to come to Nairobi. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, I'm one of the proudest Kenyan. When in the last 10 years, I really consider this the country of the world. If you look at how, what you're calling education, it's fully decentralized. There is a university virtually everywhere. And I think, yes, we should have this, but it comes with time. And I think, uh, other than really talking about what we didn't do, what I feel that we do have a strong opportunity as a Kenyan, as the city of Nairobi and as many cities in this country, especially when we talk about devolution. The 47 counties, they have absolutely opportunity to develop everything they want in their own um, counties. But I think what we are being told here and what we are learning here is that it doesn't just happen. It needs to be planned. What Nairobi is doing, and you think about the ICT city, you think about the diplomatic city, Think about what is being developed around Nairobi and the thinking of a metropolitan city. And those white and elephants? I, I, I don't think so. I, I think as Kenyan, we have come to a point that we really have been able to come to a conference like this. Here, what has worked elsewhere. We have visited those countries. I, I think um, my Kenyans are good travelers. And I think we do observe. And I can tell you some of the things have been seen, been put in place. It's what we have learned, just to have a mayor who is coming from the private sector. I personally think that's a good gift for this country because what is going to happen, he's not coming with a political baggage, and I hope he's not. I hope he's watching and that we don't expect him to come with a political baggage. We expect him to come as a manager of the city that is going to have new ideas and give opportunity. I'm participating in a project that the UN Habitat is constructing over 2,000 units, low-income houses, just here in Mavoko. But why? And, 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 let, me just say yes. this. let me just say this. And I think just being able to move the people who are sitting in low-income, in no housing shanties, to come to a place where it's well, where me and you would want to, live. Would want to go and stay, a where question. we have to pay 50,000 to stay. There's a but question the UN Habitat, in. the Ministry of Housing, the, uh, the government of Finland, they are providing an opportunity to show us the examples of how we can go 
out of the cluttered city and develop satellite places where people can actually... There's something I want to bring in because that, that actually sounds fairly familiar. I'll do that in just a second. We have, obviously, um, quite a number of people in the room. We have been seeing them as we've been going along, and I know they have a number of questions to ask, and so we have microphones all over, and uh, you have the opportunity to just grab one, and you'll ask. And as you do that, as you grab a microphone, whoever is ready to ask a question, if what Esther is saying is true about establishing satellite cities, building the sort of places where you'd want to live, it has been tried before. We have had these showcase areas done. In Nairobi, it used to be a, a place called Buruburu, which was built in the 1970s, and it was said that it was the best in the Commonwealth. However, Buruburu has gone, to this, uh, has gone rather to seed. People have gone up and uh, the planning has gone to seed. Isn't it easier, isn't it better to develop what we currently have and keep on going and establishing 20,000 new housing units, a new satellite city, a new diplomatic city? Let's just sort out what we have now. Well, you know, in, in, in my country, in Norway, we have a strategy that says that um, people should be allowed to live anywhere they want. Now, that's quite, a, that's quite an ambitious strategy. Uh, there, are, um, um, there are certain prerequisites to make that happen. Uh, one needs to ensure that social services, education, um, uh, and, and the plans for that is available throughout. Uh, I think it's possible. Buruburu went wrong. <laughs> Kwanzaa City will then go wrong. Um, the other city that's being established on a private basis will also go wrong. You can do as many examples as you want. And maybe it's unfair to ask you, I'll probably ask you, Dr. Kloss, you're, yeah. you're the one who wants to go off and establish this showcase places and see yes. that's what I it's going to look like. Oh. In 30 years, it'll all have gone down. Well, okay, yes. This is a common feature of some kind of initiative, which are, they are not big enough to be transformative, yeah. and they are not mixed enough in order to be a, a real street life and normal city. Mm -hmm. If you plan, for example, just uh, housing for the poor, yes. 6,000, then a kilometer away, a factory, then a commercial center, three kilometers, this doesn't work, you know? Mm -hmm. You need to have the city on the mine, and you need to put the mixed use of the city, you mm -hmm. know? You cannot specialize the city. Yes. I don't like when the city has an adject adjective. When the city is, uh, is the city of technology, or the city of the, uh, you know, whatever, uh, uh, the diplomat, the city of, oh. <laughs> a city should I, be I, everything? I, the city is, <laughs> I, I, it's a mix. The, uh, mestizage, the, the, I don't know the, if in English it exists yeah. this, this yeah. word, no? Uh, it's just a mixture of things, you know. Mm. Uh, you, you, you shouldn't never specialize the city because, you know, the, 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 you know the best definition of, that I know of a city? It says a city is a place where you find what you are not looking for. <laughs> like a book, good bookshop. But, but not, not, not least to <laughs> say that such a city, a specialized city, will never be uh, sustainable nor environmentally, nor socially. And I very much believe in designing cities that create uh, equity and, and social equality. Uh, and that can be designed, you know, where you mix people, you mix groups, uh, you, create, uh, you create places where mix people users, meet. Huh? That's sustainability. I, I'm getting a bit disturbed. And the reason I'm getting disturbed is that you all seem to be recommending to the planners in this room, recommending to the planners who are watching, Forget Harare, forget Nairobi, forget Barcelona. Go off and do what's called a greenfield site. No, but, but exactly that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I am a proud Nairobian. Because we have rearest, we need ICT. We don't have, Buru Buru is occupied. Other places are occupied. But we need something that attaches to the city. It's part of Nairobi. And I think if you do proper infrastructure, I'm not a planner, but I do believe that any things that are driving the city in the 21st century for cities that are existing, they have to be inbuilt. We, we, we don't have the privilege to go and start a new city in Kajiado, for example, with everything. We do have to ensure that the people from Nairobi are able to access, to, uh, to access everything that they need to live better in this city. The mayor of the no longer to exist Harare, because your city now is being recommended to not be, <laughs> be there. How do you handle that? 
Right. I was just going to give you an example uh, in support of what uh, yes. Anna, Esther, and, and John are saying. 180 kilometers southwest of Harare, we have a model city being developed. It's 15 kilometers from where we've got a world-class platinum mining operation. But we've made sure, and uh, it so happens I'm chairman of the, of the platinum company, we made sure that we got the planning right. We got an environmental impact assessment survey done, and the city is being built in a designated government growth point where there is some cotton farming, which was the, the core business there. There's ecotourism. There's a whole host of activities going on there. And so we built it to support our 6,000 employees. And 6,000 employees plus eight dependents. So now we have the financial services. That's a sizable city. Set. But here's now my problem. It's got yes. over six, it's gonna, within the next couple of years, it will have uh, close to 100,000 people living. But here's my problem. If your 15-year-old son, you come home one day and find your 15-year-old son mm. smoking, you don't throw him out and create a new son. No, no, no. You <laughs> have <laughs> to work with what you have. Of you cannot course. go yeah. off and establish <laughs> brand new cities every time you think the cities we currently have don't no, work is, for us. This is why we propose... The city is a living organism. Exactly. Is a, is a, you know, the people leave the city. Huh? And the, the city is, is changing with the people. And I like the cities that they are uh, livable and they are driven by the forces of the people eh? mm -hmm. because those are, those are the nicer cities. Mm -hmm. And this is why we advocate for planet city extensions. Mm -hmm. We don't advocate much uh, new towns. Uh, and we advocate because otherwise there's the risk that the new town, it's, it's, it, doesn't, it, it has the streets well, but it has not the, the culture nice. and the community and the and the problems, and the fights, and, and the a nice football uh, team like Barcelona. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> where you can bring Messi. Huh? Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you need to have, uh, you know, the city is a living organism. Then there's a mixture here of the planners who need to put the skeleton of it, which is the matrix of the, of the streets. And then don't plan too much, because life will draw the city, you know. This kind of artificially designed, I, I don't like these maquettes of a city, mm -hmm. because, and especially the maquette of a future city. Yes. I think that this is a petrification, this is a crystallization of the future of the life of the people. And, and, we, don't people will and we don't have, we are not gods, urban planners, we don't know how things will change. We don't know if in 10 years the economy will go in another direction. We don't know, you know then the only thing that we should retain ourselves to do as urban planners is to, do the, to, to, to produce the pattern of the, of the public space and then allow the people to mix and to create their own culture. This is why no city is equal to other. Yeah. Although we all share the same things, there's, you, there are 500,000 cities in the world and you don't see a repeated city. Let's bring it then back. With this discussion about new cities and whether to use the life of the currently existing ones, the thing is, Anna, that young people would love the idea of a new city because it's a new beginning. They'll define the life that Jean uh, Claus is talking about. But these young people turn into old people. And so the young people of 30 years from now will demand their own new city. They'll demand their own satellite cities. How do you control for that? Well... First of all, um, I think that um, ideas are created from, from things we see around us. And the thing is, we need to take into account and listen to the ideas that pop out of the heads of the young people living in these suburbs or this, these parts of the cities. Um, and uh, I think uh, what Klaus mentioned was, was very, very important. We have no idea what, um, look at technology, how it has changed yes. during the last 10 years. Um, I mean, with uh, broadband and all the transportation, everything. And the opportunities in this development in terms of creating op economic opportunities and, and, and livelihoods, etc., etc. But all this has to come, um, it, it's, it's a dynamic process. And I think we just sort of, we, we, we need to uh, let it loose and listen to the ideas that, that come up from, from, from uh, out there in the streets. 
as we sort of come to an end then, um, and I'll probably begin with you, um, sort of your last statements, where does that then leave your urban planners, your city managers, even your business people, your young people in these towns and cities in <coughs> the second, third decade of the 21st century? What sort of decision then should they be making? What plans should they be having? Well, I th if I can make just one last statement, I think I want to come back to the participation, uh, yes. participation bit. Because um, uh, it's uh, young people um, need to be, they need to be heard. Uh, we need to create those arenas where they can be heard. Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't plan to, uh, too much. Are there always political arenas, though? And, and I knew it was last well, time. Well, politi well po politics is everything, isn't it? Uh, 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 we can, we can cre create political arenas, but I, I mentioned one example with, uh, with the Kenyan youth who made their voices heard through an SMS platform. You know, the voices are out there, and it's our duty to, to, to listen to the voice. It's out there. Mr. Mayor, where does that leave you? My main message to, to the viewers and listeners is simply this. We need to depoliticize service delivery issues because you know, we need to, to make sure we cater for the divergent interests of, uh, of, the, of the motley mix of people that gravitate towards cities and, and just reduce everything to its basics. Are, are, are they, can they be contradictory though when, when you say that, that mm -hmm. you have to incorporate everyone's voice? Sometimes they want things that are directly in combat with each other. Yeah, but, but you, you need to listen and listen attentively to what the needs of the various stakeholders are. But, uh, but when you break these needs down to their basics, people want to wake up in the morning, turn on the tap, there's potable water. People want to drive over potholes, free roads. People want uh, access to, to reasonable medical facilities, schools, and all those things. And all those uh, service delivery areas are completely devoid of any ism. And, and, and the last message is the, the need for, for, for the people that live in urban areas to, to realize that uh, they, they need to pay for the services. And, and those cities that are sitting on assets that can and should be leveraged to generate the much needed revenues to fund these service delivery programs, you know, it's long overdue for them to wake up and smell the coffee and, and, and get on with it. That's the, the whole issue of voice inclusion and all that. Yeah, and I just want to say that there are, there are things we do not have, uh, that, that they are must, and we know. Populations are increasing. The population is increasing and people are moving to the cities, and that's a fact. And that we're also saying that cities are not homogeneous, and I think that's what... Um, everyone is saying here, that we'll have cities that were already developed and they are cluttered by now. And we must have a strategy on improving how those cities can deliver to the people that are living there and expand it for the future generation. Because we're not going to close cities. I was in Detroit, De Detroit, Detroit, yes. Detroit in the US. It's pathetic. And, and maybe that's why I agree with you. Where you don't want a satellite city like Detroit where you have the cars factory and we have uh, schools and then I went there and nobody lives, lives in those schools and nobody manufactures cars there. No one lives there. That's not what we are saying. But we are saying that in Nairobi City, adjacent to Nairobi City, let's make sure we have uh, ability to provide what Nairobi City requires and be able to map out the kind of resources that are in the neighborhood. And that's why, for me, metropolitan city is very, very important. But we are also saying that even the youth are not homogeneous. I think in my lifetime of working in development work, I think more often than not, we have the face of a young man, a young boy, when we talk about youth. <laughs> very few do we have young women included and the face of the young women be part of this development. Forget the fact that whenever we think of a young man, we see them as thugs. We see them as criminals. That's a mind we have. And Be careful, I'm a young man. If they come <laughs> yeah. from the, you probably yeah. don't come from a slum area or a poor background, 
But immediately we start thinking of a young person in, a, in, in the that city, context, yeah. particularly from the neighborhood, we, we really have to change our attitude about the young people. They are not always that. For some of us who came from the village, when we were coming to the, the, the city, most of us looked at us as prostitutes because that's what we were known. The, the city is known for young girls. You either come to be a house help or as prostitute. That's what, and I think these are things that we have to deal with. We are not homogeneous. There are so many things. There are social, political, economic issues, but we must ensure that everybody, we are not homogeneous at all. Everybody, we must start new cities. The county government must start new cities, must develop the small towns and make sure that they have learned from the experience of the past, but we must be able to improve Nairobi, Kisumu, and Mobasa, because we are not going to move to the new cities. We will stay here. Dr. John Close, you're the world's mayor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that um, uh, uh, city, uh, as, as she's uh, you know, transpiring very clearly, is an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. You need to build a community. You need to build a place to, to live. Uh, it's not just a technical thing. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I will so, just say two or three recommendations. First, enforce and infor, reinforce uh, the local government. Uh, mm -hmm. And choose a good mayor, a passionate mayor, man or woman, uh, committed to the future of the city. You know? And give some money to him, or the ability to collect money as the mayor of uh, Harare. Because, uh, you know, if you need to provide water and all that, without money, you cannot do that. Eh? Then I think that the next step in South Saharan Africa is to invigorate local governments. And I think in that sense, what is happening in Kenya is interesting. But it's not just politically. Eh? Should be the money eh? to, <laughs> on relation to that. Or the capacity to tax. I don't know exactly. Every country has its own, but let's put a passionate person in front, mm -hmm. committed person with the future of the city, able to, to listen and understand what is going on. Uh, and the technical recommendation is do a plan extension as near as possible to the center of the city and as big as possible in order to showcase the advantage of the planet city. That is a good a place to live it at. But there's something that Esther just said, uh, which is inclusion. Whenever I think of young people, I always think of just young men, but there's also young women and uh, how to include them. And that's what will be our subject area for tomorrow. Still speaking about urban areas in the world, still speaking about cities, but that gender question, there's a lot of unique things that women have to face whenever they live in urban areas. Issues to do with security, issues to do with um, public transport, and those are the issues that we shall be looking at tomorrow on this Urban Talk series. So thank you very much for being with us this afternoon, going into evening. But tomorrow you're back with us at the exact same time, speaking more issues to do with cities, how we live in them, and how we do well in them. Thank you very much. My name is Wallace Kantai. Good evening.